hoy es un gusto tener uh, al doctor Daniel Pauli de la eh, in institución Sea Around Us y Institute for Ocean and Fisheries eh, de la University of British Columbia, Canadá, que nos trae una conferencia titulada La teoría de la limitación del oxígeno branquial, aplicaciones a los peces e invertebrados de Iberoamérica, y que es una teoría que explica cómo el cambio climático afectará a las poblaciones de organismos acuáticos y sus consecuencias en las pesquerías. El doctor Pauli es eh, nacido en París, Francia, en 1946, hizo su doctorado en biología pesquera en la Universidad de Kiel en 1979, eh, tuvo sus comienzos en investigación en el Centro para la Gestión de Recursos Acuáticos Vivos y CLARM en Manila, llegando a ser su director. En 1994 se incorporó al Instituto para los Océanos y la Pesca de la Universidad de Columbia Británica en Canadá, donde hoy posee la máxima distinción académica, es eh, eh, University Killam Professor. Es uno de los científicos con mayor repercusión en las ciencias naturales y pesquera, lo avala sus más de mil publicaciones entre artículos, libros e informes. Pauli también es co-desarrollador de proyectos célebres de modernización de software como Ecopad, la enciclopedia online Fishbase y las series temporales de captura de Sea Around Us, una trascendental proyecto que estudia desde 1999 el impacto de las pesquerías en los ecosistemas marinos de todo el mundo y del cual es investigador principal. Con esto... Eh, quiero darle paso a Daniel para que nos haga su presentación. So, voy a hablar en inglés para, porque mi español es muy problemático. Um, uh, son, hay mucho, ero, muchos errores y otros. Y voy a hablar inglés. Um, I will... I will... Uh, share my screen with you. Um, share screen. There we are. There we are. You see my screen and so I know I know essentially I have been working in uh, most uh, Latin American countries in uh, Ibero America all of them most of them and um, I have been working on the fisheries mainly but um, <clears throat> there is another way of looking at fisheries and fishing which is to look at the fish themselves and look at what the problem is. And the problem of fish actually is a problem that we don't have, which is uh, breathing. Why is this a problem? Because for fish, it is very difficult. And I'm, when I mean fish, I mean fish uh, with fins and uh, I mean also invertebrates like, uh, like uh, like shrimp and uh, squid and, and other invertebrates because uh, uh, they are very similar to fish in this regard. So it is very difficult to get the oxygen that you need if you are a fish. Uh, a liter of water, for example, contains 30 times less oxygen than a liter of air. And the water is very much more viscose than fish, than air and uh, it's more dense. So moving the water uh, is much more difficult for the fish than for us to move the air back and forth in our lung. And the diffusion of molecules is 300,000 times slower in water than in air. So breathing is actually a problem for fish. And this is why they have evolved in the course of millions of years, um, they have evolved big gills, branchiae. Um, you see here fish-like animals that lived um, 
300 million years ago, and the reconstruction of their anatomy suggests that they had very small part of their head was devoted to breathing. And they had clearly inefficient gills. Now, if you compare this with a modern fish, for example, a carp or a, a basking shark, one of the big sharks, you can see that the head of modern fish is full of gills because, because they must breathe. Now, you can have very small heads in big fish, like for example, Arapaima, but uh, they don't breathe with gills. And in fact, the Arapaima will die if you keep them in water, they have to come and breathe air. So to understand the way gills work, we have to make an analogy with the <clears throat> radiator of cars. In the front of cars, you have radiator that cools, that, that are there to cool the, the water that cools the engine. Now, the engine, motor, uh, produces hot water, and the hot water gets into the radiator, and the radiator have lamellae. So the hot water goes through the lamellae, and uh, the heat in the lamellae is taken away by the air that uh, goes through the lamellae. And you can understand right away that you could not make a, red, uh, a radiator work more efficiently if you put a radiator behind the radiator because the radiator would get hot air in the lamellae uh, that is behind and so they would it wouldn't work so you if you want to make a radiator bigger you have to make it wider or higher but you cannot make it deeper because deeper doesn't work now fish have exactly the same problem they have lamellae to get the oxygen out of the water and once once the water has gone past the lamellae, after the lamellae, there is no more oxygen in the water. So there is no, there is no point putting another, another gill after, after the, the water has been through the gill. That means, that means gills, branchiae, are really a surface. They are a surface. They do not work as a three-dimensional object. They have two dimensions, not three. So if you look at a, at a carp, it means that uh, you, you see the, the line uh, with a black line on top. It grows, this line will grow slower than, than uh, this is the gill area, the gill, the superficie of the gills. It, it doesn't grow as fast as the volume, as the weight of the fish. That means the fish, as it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, has less superficie, su su uh, surface of the gill per body weight. So per body weight, they have less and less oxygen and less and less gill area and thus less oxygen. A big fish, has less less gill area per unit weight than a small fish. And so it cannot do lots of things, a big fish, than a small fish because of this. So, so if you look at the picture in A, the gill decline, the gill per unit weight, the gill per weight, De 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 declines as the weight increase. It, it gets so low that at a certain point, the fish cannot grow anymore because it doesn't get enough oxygen. If we, this level of oxygen supply, we call it maintenance metabolism. Now you can see the maintenance metabolism is very much a function of temperature. 
So if you increase in picture B, if you increase the temperature, then the metabolism goes up. The fish has to be smaller. It has to become smaller because the body weight at which the oxygen supply and the oxygen demand become the same is smaller. And that's basically the main problem that fish have. As they get bigger, they get less. But if the maintenance, if the maintenance metabolism is increased by increasing temperature, then they have to be smaller. So we wrote a paper in, in, uh, in uh, about this in, um, in 2013. We could show that uh, little, uh, what is his name, Nemo, would be smaller uh, under on, on global warming. And I, I will try to explain this. This is not very exciting, but uh, I, I will have to explain how this happens. So the growth of a fish, that is the delta W dt, d, dw dt, the growth rate, is a function of, <clears throat> of uh, is a function of oxygen that it gets through the gills because you need oxygen to synthesize body substance. So you have the growth of the fish is a function of protein synthesis. And the protein synthesis is depending on, on oh, sorry, is depending on, on the rate at which at which the gill declines with body weight. They, they increase with body weight, but not as fast. And the difference between the two is this 0.8 or 0.6 or 0.7. And larvae don't have this problem. Fish larvae grow exponentially, but when they get uh, to be, to metamorphose when they get scale on the body and uh, the breathing becomes um, only gills, gill base. The, the rate of growth of the gills changes, sorry, the rate of growth of the gills changes and they start growing like the adults. So, so, Everything depends on this gill size and energy metabolism, which is fed by oxygen and which determines how much, how much protein can be synthesized. Now, you can see that if a fish uh, spends lots of its energy, lots, uses lots of its oxygen to move around because it is wild, it's bravo, eh? it is wild type then it has no it has less energy for growth the 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 energy metabolism is used for activities whereas if the fish is quiet it used for protein synthesis and so a fish that is quiet is that is domesticated will grow very fast whereas, whereas a wild type grows very slowly that's the reason why in aquaculture we want to have quiet fish. And also it's the reason why we want to aerate ponds. Uh, the, these pictures are from China and you can see that in Chinese aquaculture, they spend a huge amount of money on aerating the ponds because uh, you need oxygen for the fish to grow. Now, therefore gill size is the important factor in, uh, in uh, fish growing. And the various activities that uh, the fish uh, undertake, they all work against growth. In other words, a fish can be very active, very, very uh, challenged, very, it can be exposed to all kinds of problems, but then in that case, it doesn't grow well. And we can actually explain 
through this simple model, why we have so paradoxes. The first paradox is that, um, that in most um, species, about 80% of the species, the, the female get bigger than the male. And many people believe that uh, fish uh, stop growing, they, they, their growth uh, stops at some point because they, they reproduce. But if this is true, if this is correct, then the female should always be smaller than the male because, uh, because, uh, because the female invests far more than the males in reproduction. In reality, the female actually get bigger because they are more quiet. The males are always fighting and, and messing around and they waste their oxygen on activities and the females don't do that, don't do that that much. In other words, we had a contradiction that we can resolve if we understand that oxygen is a limiting factor. Also for aquaculture, it's very important. The fact that as a fish get bigger, it, it, it converts the food conversion efficiency, the conversion of food into growth declines and it it declines because they are they have less oxygen than they when they are big than when they are young uh, you it is ex extraordinary but if you look at the literature if you look at the the references that are available uh, there is no good explanation why the food conversion efficiency of fish declines with size and the reason why it declines with size is because they have less oxygen per unit weight. And you can see this in aquaculture. If you farm a fish, uh, you, you need less and less uh, per unit weight as they get bigger uh, because they don't, they don't grow anymore. And really at the end, when they are very big, they will not grow, but eat and they eat what is needed for maintenance. So in aquaculture, you never wait until the fish is big. You always uh, uh, market them earlier. Now, this business about oxygen being limited also explains why young fish and young uh, mussels and, and clams and oysters and so on, why they have daily rings in the otoliths. Uh, they have uh, rings that you can see and the adults don't, you cannot see that these daily rings. Their daily rings, you can see them, uh, they are formed by a variation of the pH. Uh, when the fish is very active, uh, it's oxygen, the oxygen level in its blood sinks, the oxygen level in its tissue sinks and the pH sinks also. In other words, when a fish is very active, it is out of oxygen and, <clears throat> and uh, the pH or, or in, the, in the body gets very low. And a low pH, as we know, is acidic. And it, the, this will mark, this will make a mark on the otoliths. And at night, when the fish is quiet, uh, it recovers and the synthesis of, of uh, matrix of the, for the otolith is uh, again a uh, process, is, uh, is again active. And, and so you have daily rings. And this is funny, but there is no other good explanation as to why there are daily rings in, um, in uh, fish. And in otoliths, in the otoliths of, uh, of uh, fish, the small fish have nitrogen, contain nitrogen, the big old fish do not. This is because again, <coughs> they have no access to oxygen when they are old. Uh, also, most young fish, young fish contain lots of oxidative enzymes in their body. 
and old fish of the same species, big old, contain glycolytic enzyme, which means that uh, basically uh, they, in old fish, operate uh, in, a, in an environment, uh, in a tissue, the body uh, has little oxygen available. I will skip that. Now, the question as to why the fish spawn when they do, you probably have in the textbook, they tell you that they, the fish spawn when they, when, when uh, the, the eyes perceive uh, certain cues, uh, for example, uh, light or, or, or other cues that uh, are used to produce a, a hormone in the pituitary gland and then this hormone triggers another hormones and it, another one, and you have a series of hormones. And this cascade is then the reason why they, why they, why they start spawning. The problem with this, however, is that a fish that lives, for example, several years, uh, a fish that lives 30 years, will spend the first year of its life without perceiving uh, and uh, the environment that tells it that it should spawn. It's like a child that doesn't see people of the other sex. Uh, for example, my son, when he was eight, did not see the beautiful ladies. He saw them only when he was 13 or 12 or 14, because he was, he was, his body was not ready to receive, to actually see them. And it's similar uh, with fish. When, when a fish uh, grows, its oxygen supply declines, I, as presented before. And at some point, it will become so low that they cannot grow anymore. So clearly, they have to spawn earlier than that. So in A, you can see that, uh, for example, uh, they spawn at WM. This corresponds to a level of metabolic rate of oxygen consumption that is higher than uh, at the, that the maximum they can reach. And this, uh, there is the ratio between QM and Q infinity is, is there, you can, you can see it. Now, if you take, if you, if you put this fish in warmer water, it will have an elevated metabolism it will therefore become, stay smaller because the maintenance metabolism uh, cause it to be earlier uh, at a smaller size <clears throat> supplied with just enough oxygen. This means that it has to spawn at an even smaller size. So QM and Q, Q infinity uh, also will have to have a, a ratio. It turns out that the ratio between these two, A and B, is actually the same. Uh, come on. Sorry. This, there is the ratio. Uh, basically, the length at first maturity of fish and is uh, related, obviously, to the metabolic rate and the length at first uh, that the maximum reach, uh, maximum size they reach is also related to the metabolic rate. So you can re-express the metabolic rate in terms of length and you can actually calculate this ratio 1.36. That means when, when a fish has reached a size where it is where its metabolic rate is 1.35 or 36 of 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 its uh, of the lowest metabolic rate that it can have, then it will spawn. Now, you, why is it important? Because, because it applies to all fish. The, uh, the small fish here are guppies. The big fish here are tuna. And this has been, this, uh, this was published in 84. This has been, uh, in the meantime, reproduced for Salmonid, it has been reduced, reproduced for tilapia, 
It has been reduced uh, it for reproduced for coral reef fishes. It applies to all fish. And we, we are working with colleagues in Brazil and other places that will, uh, who show that it is also, a, it also applies to shrimp and uh, to other animals. So basically the factors that reduce the maximum size of animals, of, of animal that breathe water, fish and, and shrimp and so on, is also the factor that reduce their size at first maturity. So anything that reduces the size of an animal in the water will reduce the size at first maturity. The two things go together because this relationship 1.36 is more or less fixed in all animals. That was a, a very new finding. Okay, now, uh, sorry, this uh, is too, ex okay, another, Another important feature of fish, uh, including fish that occurs in Ibero-America, is that when they are bigger, when the temperature low, is low, uh, the, the fish that, are, that can handle cold temperature, they will get bigger at the larger, at the colder part of their range. And uh, this is demonstrated for, for thousands and thousands of species. And you can see that if you take, a, for example, flatfish in the North Sea, where the small ones occur on the coast and the big one occur in deeper water. But you can also see that in Hawaii with uh, meru, with groupers and, and, and snapper and, and other fish, where if you go, if you plot the size against depth, you can see that they get uh, bigger and bigger uh, in deeper water. Why? Because they, the temperature is cooler uh, in deeper water. So they, they, they reduce the, the oxygen uh, requirement and, hand, and, and therefore they can grow big, bigger. Remember, uh, uh, as a fish get bigger, it, it has very little oxygen. So the best way to do to 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 continue growing is to reduce the oxygen requirement, and uh, the fish do that by going into deeper water. Another thing is that the migration of fish also get explained that way, because, for example, in West Africa, I, I couldn't find uh, something that clear in. Uh, in South America, so I'm, I'm showing a West African example. Uh, the the sardine uh, and other fish they move back and forth, north south uh, seasonally, uh, 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 from Senegal to Morocco and back in in the course of a season. And you could ask yourself why they do that, why they do this migration. But if you plot instead of plotting the geography. If you plot the temperature simply, you can see that the fish stay migrate in order to stay in the same temperature. And, and this is very important because uh, when fish migrate, people always explain this in terms of they going there to get enough food or they going there to reproduce. Actually, it's not so. What they do is they try to stay in the same temperature range. And, and then in the course of this migration, they eat and they spawn, but that's not the reason why they migrate. So because fish are very dependent on exactly being in the same, in a, in a proper temperature for them, because getting enough oxygen is a problem. We have, we have, uh, we can plot with the increase of temperature uh, that is due to global warming, we can plot uh, the migration that fish will have, will experience in the future. And this is a paper that was uh, uh, written by a number of our colleagues, uh, with a number of colleagues. And this was the first map that showed the migration of fish and fisheries um, that will occur in uh, 30, 40 years. Uh, you can see that uh, there is a, a, 
uh, intertropical belt uh, of, of reduction of catch that will be due to the fact that uh, the fish are leaving the tropics and moving toward the poles. And that is a, a, big, a big problem. And this is the reason why this map was used by the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, to show that was the first map of, uh, that they showed in a fifth uh, assessment uh, for the effect of, uh, of climate change on fisheries. Now, what I showed you is a projection. We can actually, uh, but uh, global change, uh, global warming has already happened. And from, 2000, from 1970 to 2009, for example, this change have already happened in a, uh, uh, with a strong, strong uh, uh, warming in the in the Atlantic, in the North Atlantic, and in East Asia. Now, we we can actually show this um, this effect, uh, this migration effect that has up happened in the past already. We can show that using a new concept. That is the, the, the mean temperature of the catch. You see, if you have a group, if you catch uh, fish of different, of, uh, of different species, say with a troll, you, each fish has a, a preferred temperature. Uh, this species here uh, has eight degrees, this one 10, this one six, this one 12, could be the same with this species in Venezuela, caught in Venezuela has 26, this one 25 and so on. The, the, the preferred temperature of a fish is, uh, is easy to assess. This is usually at the center of the, the temperature of the center of the distribution. And this preferred temperature doesn't change rapidly. It takes millennia to change the temperature preference of a fish. And therefore uh, you can actually treat it as a constant. Now, you can, the, if you have a catch of a country, for example, you can compute the average preferred temperature weighted by the catch. We call it the mean temperature of the catch. And if you look at the upper picture, in, in subtropical and temperate uh, ecosystem, the mean temperature of the catch is, is this more or less the same as the temperature itself. Uh, it increases and uh, this is the uh, this is due to to the the composition of the catch changing uh, you see if you take a country like uh, let's say let's say argentina it will have fish from brazil and the increasingly because uh, it, brazil is warmer and this warm water fish leave and leave to argentina and in Peru, they will have more fish. They will export fish to Chile, as they do when there is an El Nino event. And in North America, uh, we, we see that uh, because we are getting now in British Columbia, we are getting fish from Mexico and fish from uh, California. Uh, we're getting uh, humble squid, giant squid in, in the summer in uh, British Columbia and in in on the east coast uh, fish from florida are showing up in new york and so the mean temperature of the catch for new york for example fisheries would be increased by fish from florida and the temperature itself increase this it's parallel what happens in the tropics in the second panel below well the the temperature is increasing but uh, the mean temperature of the catch can increase only a little bit. After subtropical fish have left, they cannot be a change in the, uh, in the temperature of the catch because tropical fish are not replaced in the tropics by, by hypertropical fish. They are, uh, they are stuck. The tropical fish leave and some stay, but uh, the mean temperature of the catch remains the same. So that means um, this is a measure of trouble, trouble that uh, can be also expressed 
uh, as shown here. Uh, on the right side, on the left side, sorry, you can see the subtropic and temperate uh, water. Uh, and basically, we had in there in, in the 70s, fish with cold water affinity, blue fish, and a few orange or red fish, uh, subtropical fish. And basically, the, the, in the year 2000 and now, uh, the, the fish with warm water affinity, with cold water affinities, have already left. They are already leaving, and we are getting more um, um, warm water fish. In the a, in a future, we will have in temperate areas only subtropical fish. And in the tropics, though, the situation is, uh, is problematic because you start with tropical fish. So basically, you can have only less, fewer tropical fish. And in the future, uh, it is, this is what caused the decline of uh, tropical fish, uh, uh, of tropical fisheries uh, in the future. I'm, I'm really sorry about this. Uh, but it is it is what uh, what the future um, what you can predict if nothing change. So basically, basically, we will have we will have invasion. We will have invasion in uh, in high latitude country. Of, uh, of, uh, of fish from low latitude country, and this will continue to increase. However, we can make better prediction of, of what fish will do if we, if we really take account of the fact that fish have problem breathing. The, the, the regular uh, assumption that people make that they, well, that fish must eat. They must eat, obviously, like us. But uh, they 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 have problem breathing that we don't have. We mammals, we we breathe air, and we breathing is very easy for us. But uh, it is not easy for fish and and shrimp and so on. And so we we have to look exactly at, we have to look more at oxygen supply in, for example, in farms, in aquaculture, and because feeding is not the major issue in aquaculture, it is meant, is it preventing having no, not enough oxygen. So the theory that uh, I call GOLD, uh, the gill and oxygen limitation theory, um, will be better armed to answer question if you if you understand that the, that you will better understand the, the question that uh, that the public or politician has about changes in the ecosystem that you are responsible for and uh, everything that I have presented you uh, today uh, I can I can send papers that document these things and I do you, all you have to do is to write me at uh, d.poly at oceans.ubc.ca and I will send you papers uh, that uh, document uh, this, these things. So I stop sharing my, my uh, presentation and I, I will answer question if you have any. Thank you very much. The Mediterranean. Uh, this is one of the areas of the world where the where the change and the warming is most rapid, especially in the eastern part, because of the Suez Canal and uh, the invasion is facilitated from the Red Sea. So the Red Sea is is invading the Mediterranean, and uh, they have in the Mediterranean big, big problems with invasive species. And uh, some fisheries have collapsed because, um, uh, uh, because of the invasive, invasive species. And uh, 
uh, my, uh, I have colleagues in Greece and in Turkey that have used uh, the mean temperature of the catch to characterize the changes. And you can see uh, it, the mean temperature of the catch increasing very rapidly uh, in Greece, for example. Uh, they have an increasing fraction of, of fish that were not there before. Very good. One of the consequences of your theory would mean that the stock management should be carried out without the consideration of countries but regional conditions. Is that true? Yeah. Uh, one of the consequences of this is that uh, when you allocate resources between countries, you have to take into account the fact that in a few years, the fish will have moved. And uh, this is, uh, for example, if you have a, a series of countries, uh, you have uh, Brazil and you have the Guayanas and uh, you, have, uh, uh, um, you have Venezuela, or you have uh, uh, Ecuador, uh, uh, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, Chile. Uh, this, uh, when you have a latitudinal range of, of, of countries, The, the fish are likely to move. And uh, we see that in the uh, US, for example, uh, that the fish from, I mentioned from Florida are moving to, the, to New York. And uh, they, in Europe, it has uh, caused big problem because uh, they have negotiated uh, agreement to share the stocks of between Norway and Iceland and uh, they, They took five years to, uh, uh, to, to get to an agreement. And when the agreement was uh, done, uh, the fish had moved. Uh, they had moved to be only in Iceland. So they didn't need to share uh, the, the stock with Norway and the negotiation were useless. So this, this is a real problem because uh, the fish are moving across, board, uh, across uh, political borders. Great. Uh, mitigating, yeah, uh, mitigating the the effect uh, that I have mentioned. There is um, basically it, it is we we should not emit uh, this. The best mitigation is not not em to emit so much carbon dioxide. On the other hand. The, the fish are exposed to higher temperature than, than before. So how they handle it? Well, uh, if you have a, a very small um, biomass of fish, if you have only a few fish of a given species, they, the response uh, of this uh, fish will be, will, the, the range of response, it will be small. They will all do the same. If you have lots of fish in the water, uh, you have uh, more variance, uh, you have more variety in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the response. And you will have some fish, because you have more, that uh, can resist better, uh, a more resilience to temperature. So basically the, the, the moral of the story, what you have to do is to leave as many fish as possible in the water. And Leaving fish in the water is what we do in in uh, in uh, marine uh, in marine protected areas. So we we have to create more marine protected areas and to manage stocks to leave enough of them in the water, which is also good for fisheries because they make more money if there is more fish in the water. Okay, next question. Uh, so, so the zooplankton and the phytoplankton also have preferred temperature. And basically when the fish move 
toward the North Pole in the Northern Hemisphere and toward the South Pole in the Southern Hemisphere, the zooplankton and the phytoplankton will also do that. So you can say that it's the whole ecosystem that moves. However, it doesn't move, not all elements of the ecosystem move at the same, at the same rate. So basically you could have a fish moving, but the prey of the fish is not moving. Or you can have the prey of the fish moving, but the fish is not moving. So you can expect lots of disruption. For example, uh, we have now here uh, Humboldt squid, uh, large, uh, large squid that have no predators. And that is because the predators have not moved, but the large squid has, has moved. So basically, the zooplankton and the phytoplankton adapts very fast because they have a, a, a small, uh, a shorter lifespan and uh, they turn over very fast. <clears throat> so zooplankton and phytoplankton can adapt a bit better than, than fish with, uh, and, uh, and the disruption uh, because they don't adapt at the same speed will cause uh, disruption in ecosystems. Yeah, um, the, <clears throat> the, the perspective for cold water fish are, are problematic. Uh, for example, um, truchas, the, 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 the trouts, um, are, are in many environments are not uh, fit anymore because it's too warm and uh, the oxygen requirement uh, are not met. And um, so, so the fish that are adapted to very cold water are in trouble. And uh, they are first getting a bit smaller, and then uh, they they don't fit anymore. And um, it is clear that if we do, do not manage to turn around the warming, if it continues to warm, they will be the first species to disappear. They will be the first species to disappear. Th this cold water species will be the first to disappear. And uh, we see that. Uh, uh, for example, the bacalao is a species that is very well adapted to, to varying temperature. And uh, in the North Atlantic, it is replacing cold water uh, species that uh, polar species that were uh, adapted to live in very cold water because it's now getting warmer and bacalao is inv the invasive species that is coming from the south of the North Pole. Mm -hmm. So the, I mentioned the, the Mediterranean, I already mentioned the, the, the change in the ecosystem uh, is, is the Mediterranean Sea is enormous, uh, especially in the Eastern Mediterranean Sea because of the Suez Canal uh, and fish can get from the Indo-Pacific into the Red Sea, uh, through the Red Sea into the Mediterranean. So if you want to see the future, uh, you look at uh, the Eastern Mediterranean, which is full of invasive species and a few fisheries uh, for traditional fish that uh, are from the, from the Mediterranean have collapsed because they are not there anymore. And also, uh, uh, fish uh, have invaded that, for example, eat all the all the the, the seagrass, uh, and that is very very bad. Um, there is a fish called uh, ciganus, uh, rabbit fish. They eat seagrass, and uh, uh, the seagrass are very important in the Mediterranean, and uh, the the seagrass are then threatened by this invasive species. Yep. Oh, Jaime Mendo, hello. So, 
to the, the, the temperature preferred by species um, is what we use is the temperature, the average temperature at the center of the distribution. Uh, if, you, if you plot the distribution of a species, it will cover uh, warm water and cold water, uh, but uh, at the center of the distribution where it is most abundant, it's uh, where the preferred temperature is. That's what we use uh, for the, the, uh, the, the, uh, to estimate the MPC, MTC. And uh, um, the, there is a, um, a, a software, uh, it's called um, uh, Aquamaps, that gives uh, temperatures for lots of species. Uh, so, yeah. Um, the, with regard to migration, that will depend locally. I, the migration are not all due to temperatures, to temperature change. For example, in the Amazon, it's not temperature that change. It's 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 everything. The uh, the the high water, low water uh, is connected with temperature, but not so much. But in the marine world, um, uh, when the temperature gets low, they or too low, they they go away and they come back when the temperature is right. When it's too hot, they go away and they come back when it's right. But it will it will depend on on um, on the local condition. Generally, you can say on the northern hemisphere, the fish go further north in the summer and they go further south in the winter. And uh, uh, the, the, it also applies to the southern hemisphere, except that it is different month. Yep. So, it is very difficult to, to show that tropical fish are being affected right now. Because uh, in, in the tropics, you have uh, lots of species and uh, not many researchers. So you can, it's very difficult to, to, to demonstrate that a species has not been overfished and has not disappeared because of pollution and has disappeared because of the high, the high temperature. In other words, pollution in, uh, in freshwater uh, and coastal waters, uh, overfishing and high temperature work the same way. They reduce the certain fish and it's very difficult to separate them. Uh, but we have evidence that uh, of movement that are induced by the temperature in uh, in a subtropic and an, in a temperate zone, and uh, the the for the tropical zone, we have to assume that there is no reason why we should they should not uh, behave like the other fish. See, this is very difficult to demonstrate that a, a given species is move, has is declining because of global warming. It is not obviously the fishers will say that, oh, this is not our us who have overfished the, the fish. Uh, this is because of climate change. But they, they, they are difficult to separate this effect. I, I admit that. So thank you for the compliment. I, actually, I was uh, confused a bit. Uh, but uh, the, the map that I showed you shows that uh, the countries that will be most affected are countries that, uh, that are completely in the tropics. So for example, a country like Indonesia, who is, which is, uh, uh, which is uh, along the tropic, along the equator, will be more affected than a country that is, that is uh, like Argentina or, or Chile that is goes from north to south. And um, so countries that are in the tropics in a, in, in only will be most affected. And that is uh, unfair. Uh, that certainly is uh, unfair because these countries are not the one that have produced all the greenhouse gases, but uh, they will be most affected because 
the fish that are leaving the tropics are not replaced. Whereas the fish that are, uh, for example, leaving uh, California, you, California in the US, will be replaced in part by fish from Mexico, right? So you take US California, their fish move to, to British Columbia, where I live, and, uh, but their fish are being replaced by Mexican fish. But uh, in, in Mexico, in a trop and, and further down in a, toward Panama and so on, there is no fish to replace the species that are leaving. So that that's, would be the tropical countries. So basically, a good point. Um, echinoderms, sea urchins, and sea cucumbers have no gills, really. Um, but uh, the, the problem that they have is that they breathe water. Uh, all, all animals that breathe water with gills or using, using other organs have the same problem, that water has, doesn't have much uh, oxygen and that uh, uh, it is difficult to get this oxygen into their body. And so they will be affected the same way. And really the theory that I presented should not, be, should not have gills. It should have respiratory organs because it, it's valid for, uh, for all water breathing animals. In fact, I've, I've written now several papers about invertebrates uh, that uh, are that uh, um, yeah uh, we can show that uh, they they are affected the same way as fish and uh, I'm very happy that you are using the the CMSY uh, I would recommend that you use uh, uh, a, a newer approach because the uh, the Martel and Froese model method has been improved a lot. It's called CMSY++. And no, the model does not include uh, temperature. Um, uh, if you have um, 20 years of data, for example, uh, you can actually do the assessment without considering temperature. If you do the assessment over 60 years, if you have data that goes 50, 60 years, then perhaps you have to consider the, the expansion of the, of the range. And uh, this would, uh, the, the change in carrying capacity. But uh, in, for most assessment, uh, where you have a shorter um, temperature, sh a shorter time series of catches, you, you don't have to in, in, uh, take account of global warming. And in fact, the, the sim this simple model uh, that is called now CMSY, uh, I will, I will uh, send you a newer version if you write me uh, an email. Uh, uh, the model doesn't allow for including temperature. Uh, in, no, we 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 didn't do the we didn't project uh, the effect of stock biomass instead of a catch, um, uh, because at the time when when we did these papers that I showed you, um, we we had uh, we had we didn't have stock biomass for all of this, um, for all of these stocks. We do now, and I expect in the next years that, that we will present uh, analysis that includes the biomass moving uh, toward the poles, North Pole and South Pole, uh, rather than the catch, um, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> so so if if you it's true that if the, the fish get smaller, they will reproduce at a smaller size. 
So the question is, well, then let's catch them smaller. <laughs> but, but it makes everything worse, right? Because if you make them even smaller, you will have even fewer uh, big ones. Uh, and, and then you will have a, a genetic effect uh, added to the, the, um, the effect of temperature. Because if you, if you fish, uh, big fish, uh, for a long time, there is a genetic effect on the fish that they become smaller. So basically, we, they become smaller because we fish the big ones, and then they have problem breathing. And so basically, we, the, the, prob, the, the, the problem gets added. Uh, they, they have problem with breathing, and then they have problem uh, surviving to maturity, and then they have problems uh, because they get caught. Uh, basically, if we want to have fewer problems, and if we want uh, stock to maintain themselves, we have to keep, we have to leave them alone for a while. Uh, and uh, th that's why we need marine protected areas with no fishing. Uh, that's a good question. I actually, I don't know. I, I would think that fish that have a higher metabolic activity um, would be, would be, would be more, more contamination uh, products would be ingested or, or assimilated. And uh, they, they are likely, to, I think, to be more susceptible to aquatic pollution. Uh, but I don't have any specific demonstration of this in mind. This is, a, 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 for me, a new point, a new issue. Uh, but I don't work on pollution. Uh, this is a, a, good, uh, a good question that is worth uh, uh, looking at. Claudia, you should, you should uh, look at it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think uh, we have no further questions. Very nice. It's been very great presentation and very interesting. All the topics that uh, have been discussed through the through the questions, and even a a new uh, research line has uh, has just been pointed out. Yes, it has been because we always look at what they eat because to us. We mammals uh, and birds, they eat a lot because we have to maintain our temperature. For fish, they don't have to maintain their own temperature because they have the same temperature of the water. So they eat much less than us, but uh, getting enough oxygen to burn what they eat, because that's what oxygen does, right? It burns, it allows the, the body to burn and to generate energy. Uh, uh, it is difficult for fish and so, we people don't think of this, of, of they cannot think themselves as a fish. But if you think yourself as a fish, like ah, oh, 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 you have you cannot breathe properly, that you begin to understand what they what they go through. And even for aquaculture is is helpful because you saw this picture, and that's my last point. You saw this picture of this uh, Chinese aquaculture. They have huge amount of money invest invested in aerating the pond why do they do that because aerating the pond means that the food is better used is used to 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 is converted to into flesh if if you don't have enough oxygen they, you cannot uh, as a fish you cannot use the food you the food will be wasted so by by adding oxygen into the water they enable the food to be fully utilized. That is an important point. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Pleasure. Eh, muchas gracias, a, a Daniel, por la excelente contribución que nos ha traído y a todo el público participante por esta interesante eh, presentación.